هذا القرآن يوحدنا لطريق الخير يوجهنا الله تعالى أنزله ورسول الله معنى أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد elders brothers respected grooms السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We have gathered here for the <coughs> weekly Friday Majlis at Mahfil Abbas. I have been told that there are several Shurwat Shadi Majalis uh, today. There are people who are getting married, so it's the beginning of the ceremonies, wedding ceremonies. But more importantly, it's the 25th of Dhul Qa'dah, which coincides which with the dahul ard the expansion of the earth or the spreading of the earth it is the day when we are told that the earth the first part of the earth was laid down as a foundation which happens to be under the kaaba there are many ways of discussing um dahul ard we can discuss as to how it happened in the spiritual realm, in the physical realm, which angels were involved. But I always prefer to speak about it in a way that it's a day that we need to reflect on our relationship with Mother Earth. It's the only planet which is known to have living beings, to have life. So there are things in this earth that make life possible. So it gives life, but it's the responsibility of the living to take care of Mother Earth. And we need to understand the purpose as to why God has created this earth what is our responsibility? How are we supposed to live? And not be selfish, because we are the, not the only ones who are going to live on this planet. Today it's us, tomorrow it's the next generation. So there's something called the ecological footprint. Ecological footprint basically is the amount of land or the amount of earth that every living person uses to meet his demands or to meet his needs. So be it food, uh, his waste, there's an amount of land that is needed. So based on these statistics, they say we are presently not living on 1.1 Earth, but we are living on 1.5 Earth. So we are not only living on our own world, but we are borrowing it from the future generation. That's how much demands we have placed on Mother Earth. So this is a day which is an ideal day for us to reflect as to where are we going wrong. And if you see the amal, Sheikh Abbas Kumi, the way he describes the amals of Dahul Arth in Mufatihul Jinan. So we all know there's an amal to be done. The Surah, surah Shams is to be recited, was Shamsi wa Duhaha. But more importantly, you're supposed to fast. It's one of the four highly recommended days to fast in the year. One of them is Dahul Ard. And what fasting does is it has a power. So fasting has a capacity to wake a person up. So if you see the daily du'as for the holy month of Ramadan, the du'a for the first day, Allahumma nabbihni fihi an nawmatil ghafilin. Oh Allah, wake me up from the sleep of the heedless people. So basically fasting has a capacity, as in when you fast, it has a tendency to stimulate the aql, the intellect, 
and a person suddenly wakes up and realizes, no, what I'm doing is not right and I should be correcting myself. So with the disease that is going on just now, COVID-19, many theories have come up as to what is the cause. People say it's man-made, some people say it come, came from bats. So one of the theories says that these are zoonotic diseases. Zoonotic diseases are diseases that jump from animals into humans. So researchers say that 65% of human diseases, of all the diseases that affect humans, are zoonotic. They come from animals. So for those of you who read the East African newspaper, <clears throat> it's a weekly newspaper. So this week's newspaper, there was an article uh, in the East African which says the trends behind zoonotic disease. How do these zoonotic diseases come about? So this is presented by the United Nations Environmental Program, along with the International Livestock Research Institute. These two major institutions have come together and they've presented this article. So they say that there are seven main causes that cause the zoonotic diseases as to why there are seven factors that contribute to humans getting these zoonotic diseases. And I want you to listen to these seven factors. Number one, rising demand for animal proteins. So there are two or three generations here. The old generation will tell you that in our times, we used to have chicken only once a week. Even that, it was the Kenyaji chicken, not the hybrid chicken. So chicken was not readily available. But now, we have chicken almost every day. And we see barbecue joints around the corner. We didn't have them a few years back. Not only that, but meat, mushkaki. So animal protein, so the demand has increased. So they said this is one of the first factors. Secondly, he says, extraction of natural resources and urbanization. So the demand for minerals, demand for oil has increased. So humans are engaging themselves in exploration activities. Not only that, but urbanization. Nobody wants to live in the village. So everybody is moving from the village into the city. So that contributes to zoonotic disease. Number three, intensive and unstable unsustainable farming. Initially, people would have their own small farms. They would cultivate their own crops, have some and sell some. But now you have mega plantations. So they say excessive, intensive farming leads to this kind of diseases. Number four, exploitation of wildlife. There was a time there was minimum hunting, but now hunting activities have increased. Poaching has increased export of wildlife, wild birds has increased. That also leads to zoonotic disease. Number five, increased travel and transportation. In olden times, people didn't travel that much. But now what has happened is travel has increased. The world has become a small place. So with COVID, what has been affected is the aviation industry, mainly the tourist, tourism industry. People have stopped traveling, but that just shows how much they were traveling. So that is number five. Number six, the change in the food supply chain. The way the food is transported from the farms into the cities, into the markets. But now that has also changed. So now the movement of food around the world, corporates have taken it up. Small farmers have been removed from the equation. So what has happened now is it is creating confusion, immunity is going down, people are going for hybrid foods, and it increases uh, the risk of disease. And the last one is climate change. There's global warming. So definitely it makes people more prone to disease. 
So the bottom line is, if you see all these seven factors, it is all to do with humans. It is humans who have not understood their responsibility with Mother Earth. And what they do now is instead of living for themselves, they become selfish, um, they become greedy, and as a result, they end up damaging Mother Earth. So the famous verse of Surah Rum that we recite on the night of Qadr. And Sheikh Sayyid Asad, uh, Sayyid Asad, who came from Muharram, Jafri, he recited a whole series of majalis, 12 majalis based on this verse. So chapter 30, verse number 41. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Zahar al-fasadu fil barri wal bahri bima kasabat aydi nas لِيُذِيقَهُمْ بَعْدَ الَّذِي عَمِلُوا لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِعُونَ Corruption has appeared in the land and sea because of the doings of the people's hands. Why? So that God may make them taste something of what they have done so that they may come back. So COVID, whatever theories we may have, but according to this verse, God facilitates it. If God wants it, only then it happens. But when He facilitates something, there's a lesson for it so that we may wake up. So this is what is happening to Mother Earth around us. We have exploited it and we are facing the consequences. Locally, locally in Dar es Salaam, if you want to see the results of messing around with the ecological balance, I'll give you a small example. The moment you wake up in the morning, olden times we used to hear the sound of different kinds of birds. Even now, when you go to the national parks or into the wilderness, if you go camping, you can still hear the birds. But in an urban setup in Dar es Salaam, right from 5 o'clock in the morning, all we hear is crows, loud crows. Now, these crows never belong to Dar es Salaam. They were brought in from India by the colonialists to clean up the cities. Who messed up the city? Humans. Who was brought in to clean it up? Crows. So crows cleaned it, but they reproduced and multiplied. And now they have become so many, they have become a nuisance. And they have chased away all the other birds away from the urban setup. So instead of the sweet sound, of the birds, now we hear the crows. This is a small example. Second example is the Nile perch. Nile perch that has been introduced into Lake Victoria. It never belonged to Lake Victoria. But they came up with reasons, you know, the people around Lake Victoria are malnourished and they need more fish and they need more protein. It was all for their own reasons. But what has happened is, the tilapia have decreased in number. The tilapia that actually belong to Lake Victoria have decreased in number. So now the seaweeds are increasing because tilapia used to feed on those weeds. So it becomes difficult for the ships to navigate because weeds are growing along the lake shores. So this is another example. But one example that I want to uh, share with you, and I want you to listen very carefully. Because our ultimate goal is to join the dots. Because we have Shurat Shadi. This is a Shurat Shadi Madhi, so we need to give advices to the new couples. So we will try to join these dots. So one specific story uh, about how people have messed around with the ecological balance. So there's a Yellowstone National Park in the US. So in the 1930s, there was excessive hunting of wolves. People used to go out and kill wolves. So in 1930, these wolves became extinct. Now because of human activity, the wolves disappeared from Yellowstone National Park. Now this is how it goes. The wolves used to feed on the elks. The elks are the biggest deers, you might have seen the photographs, who have huge horns on their heads which look like trees. 
they are called elks. So the wolves would feed on the elks. So now that the wolves disappeared, the elks started increasing in number, one. But more importantly, for as long as the wolves were feeding on these elks, the elks used to migrate. When winter came in, they had to migrate because they did not feel safe from the wolves. Now these elks, as their numbers increased in the absence of the wolf, they started feeding on the local trees. They're called the willows. So now what happened was because there was excessive, the number of elks increased, they started feeding on these trees. So these trees started reducing. The willows started reducing. So immediately when the trees started reducing, the birds disappeared from the national park. Not only that, but the beavers. Beavers are small animals like rats who feed on these trees. They like cutting down these trees. They feed on the trees and they use the trunk and they put it on a river bank and create a dam. So they're called dam beavers. So they create a dam, a small collection of water. So fish come in and ducks come in and frogs come in. So now because there were no trees, the beavers also disappeared. And because the beavers disappeared, there were no dams, so the rivers started flowing wildly. There was nothing to stop the rivers. So there was flooding in the national park. Come 1995, the researchers reintroduced these wolves back into Yellowstone National Park. It was an experiment that these wolves belong to this national park. They have become extinct. Let's see what happens when we reintroduce them. So something fantastic happened. The wolves were introduced, and immediately the elks started migrating again. So their migration had stopped. Suddenly, within five years, they started migrating. When they started migrating, the willows started growing up again. So the willows that were growing a few feet now started growing really tall. When they started growing, the birds appeared again. The beavers, because now they had food, they could feed on these trees, they started appearing. They started cutting down these trees, creating dams. So now there was pooling of water. So the water creations also appeared, the frogs and the toads and the fish in those small, small dams. But more importantly, this was the most surprising effect. They say because of the number of trees, the soil become, became very stable. So there was less of erosion. When there was less of erosion, the rivers that were flowing wildly, now there was no flooding. So they were amazed. Just introducing wolves into the national park, the rivers started behaving. And they were fascinated. The animals started increasing, but more importantly, the wolves had an influence on how the river flowed. So the river started flowing more definitely and no flooding. Amazing. So this is the way God functions. It's the concept of al-mizan, balance. This is God's system in this world. This is just a small example. When God keeps an animal in a specific environment, there is a reason for it. There is a whole chain that it affects. So similarly, humans, we are the only ones who have brains. We have the freedom to move around. And unfortunately, we misuse this freedom. And instead of maintaining the system, we disrupt the system. And now we've reached a situation whereby we are using up 1.5 Earth instead of one Earth. We are borrowing from the future generations. So the same system can be seen in our human bodies. For those of you who have studied physiology and biology, the way the body works, the concept of homeostasis, the temperature control, digestion, hormones, everything is in balance. But when you don't respect it, it creates an imbalance and leads to diseases like COVID-19.
So if you have got this example properly of these wolves being introduced in the Yellowstone National Park and them having an effect on the rivers. So similarly, allow me to use this example for what is going to happen to these boys. These boys, young boys of our community are now getting married, inshallah. And there are so many more who are already married. Just imagine if God had created us and at the age of 13, 14, 15, hormones kicked in. So the hormones started talking, testosterone. But no institution of nikah was introduced by God. So there are communities around the world where they are trying to phase out marriage. Marriage has become very expensive. Lawsuits and divorces and so they say cohabitation. We will just live together. We don't need to get married. Or, God forbid, homosexuality coming up. So now you're playing around with the balance. Not only that, but countries like China, they say the one-child policy, it has disrupted their whole system. So they don't have manpower now, enough of manpower. A country like China. So they are playing around with the balance the way God had created and it's leading to problems. So the concept of nikah is very important. These boys who are getting married is like introducing wolves into the Yellowstone National Park. Every couple here, whoever is married, marriage is not only about a physical relationship, but there's so much that comes with it. A very small portion of it is physical relationship. But there's so much more. And now when you introduce this couple, a stable couple, a happy couple, what happens is it has a chain effect in this society. A balance is created. So here you have a male who has all the Jalali attributes of God. And then you have a female in his life who has, brings about the Jamali qualities of God. They come together and creates a balance. It's a nice balance. So the man has more of anger and the woman has more of mercy and affection and they come together and form a perfect pair and it's just God's way of creating balance in society. So marriage is a balancing act. It's not a restricting act. Many youths feel that if you get married we are going to be in prison. No. What is happening is you're bringing about balance in your life. Not only in your life but it's like the wolves in the national park. This marriage is going to have an effect on the larger society. How? So now, if you're living in a locality, I'll give you this example. You're living in a locality and suddenly somebody comes and opens a bank and opens a supermarket, a one-stop shop. Suddenly convenience increases and it makes a big difference into that locality. Now you have a bank nearby, you have a supermarket nearby. Marriage is like a bank or a one-stop shop. Three things. There is sukoon, there is mawadda, and there is rahma. You become a bank for sukoon, mawadda, and rahma. Not only for yourself, but people around you can use it. So now it has an effect on yourself, on your spouse, but in the larger society also. One. Secondly, we are told, according to the Quranic verse, that let them not be scared of marriage. If they are faqir, we will enrich them. <clears throat> so what happens is risk increases. So by getting married, your risk increases, and it increases the affluence of the society around you. Number two. Number three, according to the hadith, we are told, increases your honor. By getting married, it increases your honor. God gives you excess of honor. As an individual, your honor increases. That honor spreads to the larger society. The society also becomes honorable. So a society that has more married couples is always honorable. It's more ethical. There'll be more akhlaq. There'll be less of evil vices, evil habits. People who are happily married. 
And lastly, spirituality also increases. With marriage, we are told that a two rakat salah of a married person is better than 70 units prayed by a bachelor. Or a person spending time with his family, that one sitting is better than doing itikaf in Masjid al Haram. So you can imagine how much spirituality also increases when you get married. That spirituality is not for yourself only. It spreads to the greater community. So the community now becomes spiritual. Not only that, but now when you have children. So happy marriage leads to happy children. And when children, good children, are introduced into a community, it brings about a big difference. When COVID-19 started, one of the first things they did was they closed down the schools. Why? Because children spread diseases very fast. Not only diseases, they also spread good habits fast. So good children into a madrasa setup or into a school setup, now it creates. So it's like introducing wolves into a national park. These boys, they have given up their freedom of bachelorhood, so-called freedom of bachelorhood, and they're getting married. But what they're going to do now is they are going to make this society, this community more stable now. They're going to increase the stability of our society. So what we need to do is we need to focus on our marriages, not only those, these boys, but it's time for us to reflect on ourselves, those of us who are already married. We need to concentrate on our marriages. Make our marriages more stable, make them happier. The happier we are in our married lives with our spouses, with our children, what happens is the effects are felt by the society around. It stabilizes the society. It strengthens the society. Financially, it increases honor. It increases spirituality. But min sharutiha wa shurutiha. Nothing comes for free. It's a sacrifice that you have to give. When you come into marriage, take your spouse as a balancing act. She has come into my life to balance my life. Not to restrict me, but to balance me. Without her, I would have exceeded the limits. If both the husband and wife think that way, it leads to a productive married life and the effects, inshallah, will be seen around. May Allah give us the tawfiq to be able to implement these ideas that God has given us in the Holy Quran, but He has also designated days in the year whereby we can sit and reflect on these days so inshallah, may he give us the tawfiq to wake up and treat Mother Earth better. But more importantly, it's time to reflect on our marriages, improve our married lives, inshallah, become more productive husbands and wives in this society. We pray for the couples who are going to get married, inshallah. May Allah keep them happy, give them righteous children, and we request them that on their wedding night, inshallah, it's a night when du'as are accepted. They should also remember us in duas, inshallah. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzata wa yasifoon. Wassalamun ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.